presentation. I'm uh, one of the neurotologists at University of Florida in Gainesville. Um, today, my topic is uh, the updates and management of skull-based perigangliomas. Feel free to ask any questions during the presentation or at the end. I'll try to answer them all as we go. Let's see. I have no financial disclosures. Uh, we start today with a case presentation. A 54-year-old male presents with right hearing loss for the past six months. No other symptoms. On exam, he was noted to have a right eardrum mass. It was erythematous and uh, uh, limited to behind the eardrum. He was also having bilateral neck masses without any significant bruit. The rest of the cranial exams were intact. Here's his audiogram on the right-hand side. You can see a mixed hearing loss involving the right ear. Um, so I obtained a CT scan with contrast, which showed an enhancing lesion limited the middle ear space without significant amount of bony erosion or involvement. Um, the diagnosis was unclear, although the suspicion was high for perigangliomas. I obtained an MRI with contrast, which you can show, you can see that the lesion is enhancing avidly on MRI scan and the bilateral neck masses appear to be situated at the carotid bifurcation. So I want you to keep this case in mind throughout the presentation. What would you like to use to confirm the diagnosis of a suspected paraganglioma, actually in multiple lesions? And what are the treatment options for this 54-year-old uh, man? So today, the objectives of the presentation is to review the diagnostic workup of skull-based perigangliomas. Hopefully we'll be, help, be able to help you differentiate the anatomical and functional imaging options that are available and to discuss traditional or novel therapies for perigangliomas. And finally, we will examine our contemporary management paradigm in treatment of skull-based perigangliomas. Um, to clarify some terminology, perigangliomas are also known as glomus tumors or chemodectomas. They arise from neural crest cells and belong to a family of neuroendocrine tumors. Um, they often involve the autonomic nervous system and the head and neck. Usually they're arising from parasympathetic uh, uh, tissue and they arise when they arise from the abdomen, thorax or pelvis, they're usually sympathetic perigangliomas and obviously in the adrenal gland, they can, uh, the neuroendocrine tumors are also known as pheochromocytomas. Um, perigangliomas in the head and neck are rare. They account for 5% of all perigangliomas. Among the head and neck perigangliomas, carotid body tumors are the most common, followed by glomus jugulari, glomus tympanicum, and glomus uh, vagali. Um, glomus tumor involving other uh, area, other tissues in the head and neck have been reported, but exceedingly rare. Many symptoms can be present up in the perigangliomas. The most common is a pulsatile tinnitus that's usually due to the vascularity of neoplasm adjacent to the hearing organs. Hearing loss is very common, conductive hearing loss being the most common. However, mixed and sensory neural hearing loss can be present. New studies have shown that sensory neural hearing loss and perigangliomas uh, can be due to either cochlear involvement, the eighth nerve involvement in the CPA or IAC, and uh, also invasion of the inferior cochlear vein and cochlear aqueduct recently have been shown to, to be responsible, uh, were thought to be responsible for sensory neural component of the hearing loss. Other symptoms can be present. It's also important to specifically ask for those uh, catecholamine secretion symptoms because some people don't even uh, associate them with the potential lesion. So that's palpitation, headaches, hypertension, and et cetera, that you can see on the uh, slide. On exam, the patient may have a red or blue mass behind the eardrum if the lesion extends to the middle ear. It's important to feel and uh, uh, auscultate for neck masses that may or may not have bruit. And some lesions, when they're large enough, can present as a pharyngeal mass that has been mistaken for a peritonsillar abscess before. So just be very careful with those. And uh, cranial nerve functions exams are very important. Uh, flexible lab, uh, flexible uh, laryngoscopy to evaluate for focal core um, paralysis or paresis, and also to look for tongue deviation, uvula deviation, and pharyngeal numbness. In terms of the demographics, perigangliomas are rare, less than 1% of head and neck tumors, usually occurring in middle-aged adults in the fifth or sixth decade. Most the lesions are sporadic, and 10% of them can be familiar. This comes up on in-service exams all the time. And just because a patient does not have any family history does not mean that it cannot be hereditary or that they don't carry a germline mutation that can be passed through the generations. 
Uh, newer reports suggest that head and neck perigangliomas act actually up to 35% of those patients can be carriers of germline mutation. We'll talk a little bit more about the genetics later on. Multiple perigangliomas Gangliomas, multiple lesions in the same patient is quite rare, 10% in the sporadic cases. When the patient has family history, it significantly increases the risk of having multiple lesions. That's something to keep in mind in your workup for uh, those patients. Um, Paragangliomas are naturally slow growing tumor, about one to two millimeters per year. The growth is quite unpredictable. Um, they can be very infiltrative locally for, with a propensity to inv invade the skull base and uh, with intracranial extension causing cranial nerve palsies and when they become really big can compress the brainstem. Um, they're highly vascularized uh, lesions. That's important to keep in mind for uh, surgical resection. The most common feeding vessel is ascending pharyngeal artery, um, but other arteries are important to consider when they uh, undergo angiography, which we'll talk about later um, pre-op. Metastasis is rare in periganglioma, three to 16%. However, there's no reliable method of uh, predicting whether the lesion was likely to metastasize. Unlike squamous cell cancers, when the tumor size and local invasion does not predict uh, metastasis in this case. They tend to go to the lymph node, lung, bone, or liver, and vagal perigangliomas carry the high, a higher risk of metastasis. And catecholamine secretion, although very rare, two to 5% in head and neck perigangliomas, is important to keep that in mind, especially in patients who have uh, those catecholamine secretion symptoms we had discussed before. On pathology, this comes up on in-service all the time as well. Um, hopefully you'll be able to recognize that they're uh, characteristically composing of chief cell nests or called Zalbalin, on seen on the right-hand side. They can, be, they can be staying positive for a variety of neuroendocrine markers. And on pathology, there's no reliable way to uh, predict for malignancy or, or the risk of metastasis. Genetics is a very important part of the workup for perigangliomas. Um, uh, research has shown that up to 35% of head and neck perigangliomas can have identifiable germ germline mutations. These mutations involve succinate dehydrogenase, which is a mitochondrial enzyme complex. When there's a mutation in that complex, the cells uh, suffer through pseudohypoxia, which upregulates angiogenesis and survival and proliferation factors. And when we uh, notate the uh, germline mutations, SDHX is the way the mutations are written. The X um, denotes for the subunits A to D. There are 11 known mutations involving the paraganglioma. The D subunit mutation is the most common in paragangliomas involving in the head and neck and carries a increased risk of multiple lesions. And the subunit B uh, carries an increased risk of metastasis. So that's just something uh, to keep in mind. Um, the perigangleoma genetics are very interesting. They're uh, carried forward in autosomal dominant um, uh, fashion with variable penetrance. Maternal imprinting is a key concept here, meaning that the disease phenotype can only occur when the gene is passed from fathers and not from mothers. So you can see on the right-hand side, the pedigree, when the gene is passed from uh, mothers to the offsprings, they actually skip, skips uh, some generations um, and that's why sometimes patients do not have a very clear family history if they don't know their ancestors very well. When they carry the germline mutation, patients are at risk of inc multiple tumors, and um, they're usually diagnosed at a younger age. And the associated symptoms, as associated syndromes that uh, you might uh, recognize is MEN2, von Hippel-Lindau disease, and NF1. When we work up a patient for, uh, when there's a high suspicion for a periganglioma, biopsy is usually not advised since they're very highly vascularized and they can easily bleed significantly in the office. Um, when there is significant concern for catecholamine secretion, obviously we send the patient for a serum or urine laboratory to look for neuroepinephrine or doping metabolites. Um, imaging plays a very important role in the workup because many of those tumors are not easily uh, biopsied and uh, it's important to confirm the diagnosis and to look for multiple tumors, especially as you can see in the case presentation, the patient had actually three, three separate lesions. We will review the imaging options, imaging modalities, and the most common 
reason to imaging is to differentiate the tumor from other skull-based tumors such as meningiomas, neurofibromas, and schwannomas, which are managed slightly differently. Um, CT scan perigliomas have very characteristic mo uh, moth-eaten erosion of the bone, usually at the jugular foramen or the mastery on the left-hand side, you can see that moth-eaten uh, appearance, and these lesions avidly enhance with uh, iodine. Compared to the other lesions, again, glomus tumors usually have irregular bony, uh, bony margins, and uh, schwannomas, on the other hand, usually have a smooth expansile bony margin. And the meningiomas, even though they're irregular with the bony margins, they have a very char characteristic hyperostosis or intralesional calcification, which, which, which you can see on the right-hand side. I, I gave an example of a meningioma at a similar location. On MRI, we usually get the MRI for, for to look for intracranial extension or nerve involvement of perigang perigangliomas. They uh, demonstrate low signal T1, high signal T2, and enhanced abilene with gadolinium. A salt and pepper appearance is uh, almost pathognomonic, although it's really hard to say uh, if that's true salt and pepper in, real, in a real case. And the lesion usually restricts on DWI sequence. Compared to the schwannomas and meningiomas, which are common differential diagnoses, you can see that schwannomas can have varied enhancement. Um, uh, they can be ISO or hypo on T1, and the meningiomas usually are markedly enhancing, but the dural tail can give you a, a sign that this may be a meningioma. Uh, when, when you have a CT and MRI combination that suspects paraganglioma, it's also uh, a lot of people also get angiography prior to surgical resection. The number one reason is to identify the feeding vessels and, the, and then to perform embolization. Um, just keep in mind that some large meningiomas it can also have an arterial blush that's been mistaken before. And in patients who have catecholamine secretion, just the embolization alone can result in a crisis, a hypertensive crisis that can put them in danger. So those things are uh, important to keep in mind. We move on to talk about the functional imaging modalities. You may have heard and used PET and SPECT CT scan before, and then we will talk briefly about the radial tracers that are currently available for perigangliomas. So there are two key components of a functional imaging. Number one is the radioactive isotope that's used. Think of it as equivalent to the iodine or gadolinium. They're usually a molecular um, uh, marker that is targeted for a certain molecular uh, target in the body. And the modality to use image can be either SPECT or PET scan. So those are two key uh, components to keep in mind. The two modalities, the SPECT, uh, single photon emission computer tomography, can be combined with either C, uh, CT or without CT. Off, you can see the comparison of the two examples on the right-hand side in the same patient, that it offers low resolution. Usually the lesion has to be at least 10 millimeters. And a SPECT CT scan usually uh, is looking for molecular marker expressions, and they're cheaper and more readily available compared to the PET scans. The PET scans are positron emission tomography, which can be combined with either CT or MRI. They offer a much better spatial resolution. The lesion can be anywhere between 1.5 to 5 millimeters, and they usually measure in metabolic activity. So usually uh, the most commonly we know is the glucose uh, metabolic activity. The three families in, in terms of the radio tracers available for paraganglioma. The somatostatin receptors, the catecholamine pathways, and the glucose metabolism. We'll go a little bit into details about all those, all those just so you can uh, have those on your radar. The, the first one is the octreotide stain, scan. You probably have heard about that and may have seen one on a paraganglioma patient. They, uh, they are utilized because neuroendocrine tumors express high density of somatostatin receptors. Octreotide scan is probably the most well-established scan for perigangliomas. However, they're limited at lesions that are at least one centimeters, and they can be false positive with other neuroendocrine tumors if with inflammation or infection. So they're also not as sensitive when you're looking for abdominal or small malignant lesions. Overall, octreotide scan sensitivity is quite good. However, it's not very specific. Um, it can become positive, false positive with schwannomas, carcinoids, and small cell carcinomas and miss 
very small glomus tympanicums. And one method people have developed to look to increase the specificity is to compare the tumor to background ratio on those octreotide scans. The second uh, option for a somatostatin analog is called the gallium DOTA scan. They are uh, one research option that are available. Uh, it's not very widely commercially available. We can uh, certainly find them at the larger institutions. They offer much better spatial recognition and offers the possibility of a radioisotope treatment, which we will discuss later. Um, however, because they're relatively new, there's no standardized interpretation for those um, DOTA PET scans. You can see on the right-hand side an example of a, a DOTA PET scan. The second uh, family of functional imaging is the catecholamine pathways. The most uh, well-known is the MIBG SPEC scan. It's not very sensitive, however, it's quite specific. It offers the potential with therapy of a radioactive tracer therapy down the road. Um, and it's, uh, but it's very low resolution and can be interfered with some medications. Um, on the right hand side, you can see comparing the sensitivity of MIBG to CT MRI and octreotide scan. You might as well just get CT MRI and octreotide scan and, uh, and not bother with MIBG. Uh, however, the second uh, option in the catecholamine pathway, F-DOPA PET scan, uses a molecular marker that uh, attaches to the analog of a dopamine precursor. It's very sensitive, very specific. It images uh, lesions that are quite small, less than one centimeter, and it's very good at head and neck perigangliomas compared to other uh, perigangliomas in the body. And, and you're wondering why don't we see F-DOPA more often? Why aren't we getting F-DOPA uh, more often? Is because they're very difficult to synthesize and very few institutions actually have that radio tracer readily available. And the last one of the catecholamine, just to keep it on your radar, is the FDA PET scan. Um, it's very specific, but not very sensitive. And the last one that's pretty widely available at all the institutions is your regular garden variety glucose metabolism um, FDG PET scan. It's usually the first line of evaluation for multiple tumors or met metastatic lesions. It's extremely sensitive. It's really good for metastatic lesions. However, as you know, we also use that scan for other um, uh, malignancies and also can be positive with inflammation or infection. So it's not specific at all. Overall, comparing all the functional imaging modalities, if you have to pick one without uh, consideration for cost or difficulty to synthesize, F-DOPA appears to be the best, especially with a, a mutation-related head and neck perigangliomas, although uh, it is not widely uh, available. That's why we don't see it as often as we think. Um, and that's just something to keep in mind. Other, re other upcoming functional imaging that are in the research arena are the anti-sense imaging in vivo. They're basically detecting those gene expressions in vivo. We won't, uh, we won't uh, go into details about them, but that's just uh, something that's up in the research uh, area. In terms of management of perigangliomas, the most important part to talk about the to talk to the patients and also keep in mind is that there are mostly benign lesions, slow growing, and the goal of treatment is to minimize and reduce morbidity rather than to improve survival. So the treatment options are observation, surgery, radiation, and we will talk a little bit about no novel therapies at the end. Obvi observation obviously is reserved for people who are relatively older, frail, with multiple comorbidities and uh, without uh, too much symptom, not for everyone. Um, in terms of surgical resection, depending on the size and location of tumor, it ranges widely from a transcanal approach for a tympanicum to a large retrosigmoid combination with a translab, transodic to move everything in order to remove a uh, skull base intracranial extension of a perigangliomas. We won't go into the surgical details, but to keep in mind that complete resection um, is often the only cure for head and neck perigangliomas. We have to keep in mind that the cure rate is actually quite good. With the tympanicum, it's 92.5%. Even for carotid body tumors, the cure rate is quite high. And when the tumor becomes larger, involving different um, uh, uh, cranial nerves, then uh, the long-term control rate is still at between 70 and 80%. What are the implications for surgical resection? How, how well can we save those patients from the cranial nerve palsies or other complications? Um, in a study by Nesky et al. in 2011, um, we, 
they, they were able to show that even though post-op, about 60% of patients demonstrate new cranial palsies long-term down the road, a lot of them do recover or compensate. And ultimately at 2.5 years post-op, 35% of patients had new cranial pul nerve palsies compared to pre-op. So that's just something uh, to discuss with the patients also keep in mind. Um, this brings us to this, the other treatment option, which is radiation. It is thought to have a reduced uh, cranial nerve morbidity. However, uh, that, keep in mind that the perigonglium tumor cells are relatively radio resistant because they're slow turnover and they have a very robust repair mechanism. Radiation actually works on the vascular obliteration um, of the tumors and not actually killing the cells directly. Uh, the side effects of radiation and, and secondary malignancies are con significant concerns when the patients are quite young. Overall, the local control uh, and survival uh, from radiation is quite good, greater than 90%. And um, you do have to counsel patients that 20% of them can have uh, issues such as hearing loss, dizziness, and xerostomia. That's with traditional radiation. Um, stereotactic radiation, stereotactic radio surgery has become increasingly popular for perigangliomas and other skull-based tumors. They can be used as a primary adjuvant or salvage therapy. They offer a very steep dose of radiation, sparing the structures uh, adjacent to the tumor, such as cochlea, the brainstem, and the optic nerve, and uh, that is thought to re uh, result in minimal toxicity and morbidity. Different types are available, including gamma knife and cyber knife. And overall, the tumor control uh, for stereotactic radio surgery, again, tumor control in this case means uh, no growth of the tumor, is 93%. And there can be some cranial nerve deficit improvement, so such as pain and pain and numbness. What we're also specifically concerned about is the hearing outcome, since most of the skull-based tumors are right next to the cochlea and the in the uh, cochlea vestibular nerves. Um, but Patel et al. in 2018 studied um, 85 patients who had serviceable hearing prior to this uh, gamma knife, and they're in the long run, 80% um, of them were able to maintain serviceable hearing at five years. So uh, not everybody's able to preserve hearing, but at least most of them can have ser serviceable hearing. And uh, in the rare patients who have secreting tumors, What's the effect of radiation on the secretion? Um, previously, we had thought that secretion, secretion um, in the catecholamine secretion in the perigangliomas are usually unaffected by radiation because we thought that the tumors are uh, slowly turning over. However, newer reports, even though uh, very small numbers, they've been show that radi salvage stereotactic radio surgery in the salvage sense or the primary treatment can uh, reduce the catecholamine levels. And it's important to, re to let the patients know that the levels does not drop off as if you have surgical resection. They actually taper off over the one or two years after uh, the radio surgery. So you can see in the graph on the right-hand side that the, the uh, catecholamine level actually takes a few years to, to become normalized. It's important to keep in mind with the, in your discussion with the endocrinologist as well. Chemotherapy is available for metastatic or secreting periganglioma. It's a very tough uh, scheme. It's a cyclophosphamide, vincristine, uh, the, bar, the, the carbazine uh, uh, scheme, and the tumor response and hormonal response are still not very optimal. Obviously, uh, those patients are uh, uh, usually a pretty advanced stage, and there are significant side effects associated with traditional chemotherapy for perigangliomas. That's why we now are looking at novel therapies involving radionucleotides. Uh, usually they're reserved for unresectable perigangliomas or metastatic lesions. Um, basically, it's a selective radiation delivery to targeted tumors uh, that is delivered by molecular targets, and they can be used either as an adjuvant or neoadjuvant therapy. Uh, the most well known and the only FDA approved is the um, uh, 131 indium MIBG, which is named Azedra. It was approved in 2018 for, for uh, unresectable and advanced uh, pheochromocytomas or perigangliomas. There's a little bit of partial res response in terms of tumor reduction, and, and there is small reduction of antihypertensives. Um, significant comorbidities, comorbidities including lymphopenia, neutropenia, 
and all sorts of coagulopathies in those patients. So it's not a very benign medication, but obviously those patients need it because of the uh, involvement of the tumor. Um, other uh, radionucleotide novel therapies are octreotide or somatostatin binding radio tracers. They are e usually selected by uh, one of those functional imagings we had talked about when patients receive those um, therapies as, a, as um, they are selected by the imaging. So the response is still suboptimal, but those uh, therapies are on the horizon just so you know about them. Additional therapeutic options are also involve angiogenesis inhibitors. Those are tyrosine kinase inhibitors and also um, for the thoracic and abdominal lesions, there are handheld radiation probes that limit the radiation to just the lesions. Um, uh, those just for you to keep in mind as well. Um, so now we move on to special considerations we must have for, for management of multiple focal disease and just a little bit more about the, uh, how and who should we perform the genetic testing on. And once you have diagnosed a patient and have performed treatment, what are the routine imaging follow-ups follow that they should undergo? In terms of multifocal perigangliomas, as we have seen in the case presentation, there's really no accepted rule on which tumor to treat. It's very good to discuss with a tumor board or with a multidisciplinary skull-based team. Um, considering the symptom size and cranial nerve functions of those tumors, you might consider to remove one versus the other. And usually the resection of adrenal and abdominal lesions take precedence. Um, and in terms of bilateral skull-based tumors, um, it's usually a treatment dilemma because you are putting the cranial nerves at risk both sides. Um, and uh, when there's a jugular bulb or carotid uh, artery involvement, obviously you don't want to take both of those vessels. And in our case presentation, we saw a bilateral carotid body um, tumor and uh, resecting both sides would result in very labile autonomic function for the patient. So it's very uncomfortable. That's something to keep in mind when you sort of decide which tumor to take out first. In terms of genetic testing, traditionally, we have thought that genetic testing for perigangliomas is reserved for patients with multiple tumors, with family history, or when they're very young, less than 40 years old. However, in the newer literature, uh, we've adv advocated for genetic testing for all perigangliomas patients because, as you can see, um, no it's just because the patient doesn't have family history does not exclude an underlying germline mutation. Um, the screening of other family members, though, remains uh, very controversial, so we don't currently do that. Uh, a couple of key mutations to keep in mind, the subunit D and AF2 mutation carry risk of multiple tumors, and the subunit B carries risk of metastasis. And this is an, a very good example of a disease that when we have known about the genetic mutation that may determine the prognosis and, and actually can select the best of the functional imaging agent down the road. And in terms of how to follow those patients when they have a known perigangliomas, uh, diagnosis, the routine follow-up varies, and whether you choose to do a CT MRI versus a functional imaging really depends on how widely available those imaging modalities are to you. Um, again, we tend to screen and uh, evaluate, uh, repeat the imaging more often for mutation carriers, especially SDHD and, and uh, SDHB um, mutations because they have can they can have multiple asymptomatic tumors or carry a metastasis. Um, and even with patients who have the same mutation in the family, the occurrence of new primary tumor is very variable. So uh, that's keep in, to keep in mind. So to bring you back to the to the uh, case presentation, this is the octreal tie spec scan we have on him. He was positive for a tympanicum and bilateral carotid body tumors. His catecholamine workup was negative, and his mutations, he carried the SDHD mutation, which is also related to his multiple tumors. His glomus tympanicum was resected. However, we've decided to leave his bilateral carotid body tumors alone, and they are monitored annually with MRI. So in conclusion, I hope I've shown you that there are multiple imaging modalities in addition to CT MRI that you can utilize for perigangliomas.
Octreal tie scan is most commonly widely available. However, there are some limitations. Um, the next most available is the glucose PET scan. Um, again, uh, it's very sensitive, but not very specific. And the most specific and most sensitive one is actually F-DOPA. If you ever have the opportunity to, to, to see one or um, order one on patients, uh, we would highly recommend it. In terms of treatment, surgery remains the only curative option for head and neck and skull-based perigangliomas. Radiation offers good tumor control and catecholamine stabilization. Um, and genetic workup is recommended in the head and neck perigangliomas patients because they can alter the diagnostic and treatment algorithm. Um, and we know about the radionucleotide therapies, but they're in their infancy and can offer some partial response and symptomatic relief in metastatic and unresectable uh, patients. So that's all I have for the presentation. Let me exit out so you guys can ask some questions. Questions, anybody? No questions? Looks like there is uh, one question in the chat. What is your choice of lab to rule out secretory tumors? Oh, wait, I'm looking at the... There's also Q&A, yeah. Oh, okay. So did you say that the initial CT, this is from Sarah, did you say that initial CT scan you have showed us smooth bone? Um, the, let me just bring it up. So initial C, can you guys still see the screen or no? Yeah, we can see it. Okay. Um, the initial CT scan was not very obvious. There's not a very, it was a very small lesion. So I did not see a very characteristic moth eaten uh, uh, bone le uh, bone pattern, which is why we had additional imaging studies to uh, confirm the diagnosis. You can see that often in 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 a very small glomus to pan panicum, they're basically limited to uh, the middle ear space, so they haven't gotten time to erode the bone yet. Does that make does that answer your question, Sarah? Okay, great. Um, what is your choice of lab to rule out secretory tumors? So again, um, usually the, you work with the endocrinologist on this and we order both the serum and urine. Let me just show you. Uh, we order both serum and, wait, where did it go? It's both serum and um, urine catecholamines. They can be elevated in one or the other, but does, doesn't have to be both. That was the question form, PS. Rob Lee Liebman, I'm sorry if I couldn't pronounce it wrong. Can you discuss screening of family mem members due to their gen genetic testing too, if mutation? No, so the screening of family, family members are controversial. We don't actually recommend the to everybody, but we do obviously send them for genetic counseling. And if the, if, if the patient, family members over 18, they have the option of undergoing them, but it's not usually recommended unless you have a known perigangloma lesion. Does that answer your question? Okay, um, and then the next question from Dan Hilton is quickly review the sectional dehydrogenase absence and why this occurs. I actually don't know why that mutation occurs, <laughs> but we know that when, that, when the uh, SDH um, mutation occurs, you can see, uh, wait, hold on. You can see on this diagram that uh, certain events, cascades happened and the, the cell basically is in, under hypoxia. When you have a hypoxic cell, um, a few ha event, a few cascades happen that the, the uh, angiogenesis and proliferation markers are, are upregulated. And for some reason in those uh, cells that they become differentiated into neuroendocrine cells. 
but why it happened, I'm not sure. But that might be something you can look into and, and, and let us know next time. Does that answer your question, Dan? Okay. Discuss how you approach the treatment. This is from PS. Please, would you discuss how you approach the treatment of bilateral neck paragangliomas? So when you think about bilateral neck paragangliomas, it really depends on where in the neck it is. Obviously, you can have a carotid body tumor uh, neck paraganglioma, or you can have one side that's vagal, one side that's carotid, per, uh, carotid or one side that's jugular, and the other side uh, that is uh, a different lesion. So it depends on what you mean by bilateral neck. The case we had discussed is a bilateral carotid body paraganglioma is probably most likely to recur. Um, usually you try to take one, the one out that's most symptomatic. So for a carotid body per paraganglioma that is showing up as a neck mass, you know, you think about, is it compressing the major vessels? Is it compressing the trachea when they're becoming very large? But you really try not to sacrifice both carotid body tumors. Um, if you can leave one behind, then they have a much better control over their autonomic uh, function. I don't know if you've ever met anybody with no autonomic function. It's just very miserable, and they are basically hypotensive uh, all the time and tachycardic all the time. So uh, to answer your question, P.S., that it really depends on what type of paraganglioma it is in the neck. Does that answer your question? Other questions? Okay, I think that's uh, everything. If you guys don't have any more questions, uh, I guess, Sarah, that concludes the presentation. Is that correct, Sarah or uh, Dr. Gupta? Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. Sure. Let me know if you guys uh, have anything. You, they have my email. You can always email me later, okay? Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, good luck, guys. Stay safe.